There is a car collection worth over $5 billion just rotting away in the jungle right now. Who is this mysterious car collector? How did he get so rich? And why is he letting $5 billion worth of cars just rot away? Let's get you up to speed on the Sultan of Brunei. Owning one exotic supercar is expensive as hell. The sticker price is just the beginning. Then you have insane maintenance costs, basic parts like brakes and tires that cost more than a brand new Beamer, and not to mention all the caviar that you have to shove in your face just to fit in with the other supercar owners. But you can imagine how insanely expensive it would be to buy and maintain 108 Bentley Continentals, 70 Ferrari 456 GTs, 28 Aston Martin Virages. You gotta be dummy rich. You gotta be a sultan, like the dad from Aladdin. This is Hassan al Bolkiah, and he's the 29th sultan of the nation of Brunei. If you've never heard of Brunei, that's fine. <laughs> Brunei is a tiny Southeast Asian country, less than half the size of Connecticut. But what Brunei lacks in size, it makes up for in oiliness. The country has access to some of the most productive oil and natural gas reserves in the world. And because they're such a tiny country, a lot of that wealth is funneled directly into the royal family and the Sultan himself. Brunei gained independence from Great Britain in 1984. And with the shift in power came the rights to the country's gas reserves. So in just three years following Brunei's independence, the Sultan became the world's richest man with a cool $40 billion bag. I mean, can you imagine, dude? Look, I'm not gonna beat around the bush. Hassano is a horny dude, all right? He commissioned statues of himself having sex with goddesses. He's got a huge yacht that he named Tits. Tits. But the Sultan's younger and considerably more buck brother, Jeffrey, is even more hornier. He turned out to be a pretty strong influence on how his older brother spends his fortune. Prince Jeffrey, AKA the Playboy Prince, basically had carte blanche from the Sultan to buy whatever he wanted for the Royal Palace and buy whatever he wanted for the Royal Palace, he did. $70 million Renoir painting, freaking throw it in the car. Yachts, jets, art, lavish events, including building a $17 million stadium and enough cash to hire Michael Jackson to celebrate the Sultan's 50th birthday. Hell yeah, that's a good brother. He also had a gold-plated hot tub, because those are sick. But none of that compares to the insane amount of cash that Jeffrey and Hassanel dropped on cars. Just to let you know the sheer amount of cars they bought, sales of Rolls Royce to the brothers accounted for half of all Rolls Royces sold in the 90s. Half! To put that into context, that's roughly how much of an Arnold Palmer that's made up by lemonade. Huh? And it's not just classic luxury cars like Rolls Royces and Bentleys. Jeffrey also bought extremely rare cars in bulk. Mercedes CLK GTR, one of the sickest Lamal style production cars ever built. It's one of my favorite cars. It's got a 6.9 liter V12, makes 600 horsepower. They only made 26 of them total. 20 in the hardtop version, six drop tops, and the Sultan has one of each. McLaren made five special edition F1 LMs. The Sultan has three of those. He owns five Bugatti EB110s. Who needs five of those? Prince Jeffrey needs five of those. And one of them is painted like this. Now before long, the Brunei boys owned almost 200 Ferraris, 400 Bentleys, and over 200 BMWs. Their favorite car company though, gotta be Rolls Royce. They owned over 600 of them. I'm no math magician, all right? But if you drove one Rolls Royce per day without repeating, it would take you over 11 years before you would repeat a car. I think. What's even more impressive than my math skills are the custom one-off cars that the brothers have made just for them. Sure, a fleet of luxury cars is cool, but for the guys who have doubles and triples of everything, triples are better, what's the most impressive car that you can buy? Why, it's the one that doesn't exist, of course. 
At this point, I should mention that by the early 90s, another family member, just as crazy as the others, is now getting into cars. And he was all about ordering them crazy customs. I'm talking about Prince Abdul Hakim. More on him in a bit. Anyway, the Sultan and his family have some of the most insane one-off custom cars to ever exist. They get whatever they want. You ever heard of a Bentley Dominator? It's a Bentley station wagon that kind of looks like a predecessor to a Bentayaga, but it's a bit squatter. Since it was a secret project, not much is known other than they made six of them at a cost of $4.6 million each. But even if you had the cash, you couldn't get your dirty little fingers on one of these because all six Dominators were made specifically for the Sultan and his family. Sorry, Mark Davis. Bentley's known for having tons of different things that you can customize on their cars, like type of wood, leather pattern and color, a million different paint options. But what about stubborn car companies that don't like to customize? Someone like Ferrari. Never in a million years would bow down to some rich guy. So apparently Ferrari bowed down to the rich guy. Uh, the story goes that Prince Hakim started getting sick of ordering regular Ferraris, the poor guy. And he wanted to help design one on his own. Just to let you know, uh, the scale of this kid's spoiledness. All right, when he turned 18, he got a billion dollars in cash as a present. When he started getting interested in American football, his family paid to fly out Joe Montana and Herschel Walker to coach them. When they ran a football scrimmage, nobody wanted to tackle him. So he scored a touchdown every time he was past the ball. Just like Mr. Burns. Oh, you want a warehouse full of Ferrari Enzos? No problem, you want a Bentley modified so it looks like a car a cartoon villain would drive? Sure, dude, here you go. That football story is so funny to me. Like, did he have fun? That seems embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, in the 90s, when Prince Akeem really wanted a semi-automatic transmission in his Ferrari, everyone bent over backwards to make it possible. There was just one problem. That kind of technology, wasn't in production cars yet. Semi-auto transmissions could be found in race cars and rally cars, but they were just too jerky to put in a road car that was supposed to ride smoother than a race car. So what did the royal family do? They called up Pininfarina, who had already designed 50 models for them. Like this, Ferrari F50 Bolide, which uh, Bolide at had the same internals as an F50, but uh, a body kit and a wing. They also modified nine of 11 Ferrari F40s that the family owns. Jesus. Pininfarina put their prototype manager on the job, a dude named Paolo Gorella, who uh, worked on the Ferrari Mythos, a prototype only supercar that is honestly one of the sickest concept cars ever. It never went to market. In fact, uh, Ferrari specifically made it clear that they would never sell the Mythos, but somehow the Sultan got his grubby little fingers on two of them. Tasked with making a custom supercar with technology that didn't exist yet for a demanding, uncompromising client, Paolo got to work and contacted a company called ProDrive. You may have heard of them. Uh, they'd been making semi-automatic transmissions for their WRC cars for a while now, and they wanted to bring the technology to the consumer market. The Ferrari project seemed like the perfect the first step. Uh, I don't think they're Italian. Paolo's stallion of choice, boom, Ferrari Testarossa, great looking car. Uh, he used it to develop the Mythos years earlier, and its flat 12 was a spicy little spadini and a great building block to work off of. This semi-auto transmission would be a bit more work than he expected though. ProDrive system was super complex. It used both hydraulic and pneumatic arrangements to activate the clutch and actually switch gears. Pininfarina assigned an engineer just to figure out how it would mate to Ferrari's stock six-speed manual transmission. Computer systems were developed to make shift times as short as possible and shifts less jerky. And in the end, they were able to make it happen. Gears could seamlessly shift via buttons on the steering wheel, allowing the driver to harness every bit of those 420 hertz pairs provided by the flat 12. Pininfarina even added some special touches to the car with a Sony tape player 
and a little plaque on the inside that read FX. I assume because they are huge, it's always Sunny fans. Ferrari FX was an engineering success. Three of them were made, delivered to Prince Hakeem, and he was a delighted boy. He's such a delighted boy. I don't want three, Daddy. Then you would have a three, my son. I'm gonna go kill this dog now, Daddy. Do it, son. You know this kid hurt animals. He liked him so much, they ordered three more based off the newer Testarossa. The F512M, which had 20 more horsepower and a lighter chassis. You know what they say, triples are best, but sixes are better. Five of the FXs are in Brunei, and one got snatched up by McLaren, which is probably a good thing, because what you're about to find out about this stash of supercars is uh, heartbreaking. Five billion dollars worth of cars is a lot of cars. If you live in LA, having more than one car is a huge pain in the ass trying to find a place to park it. But what about in a country half the size of Connecticut? Luckily, like everything else, money can solve that issue. The Sultan had multiple massive concrete garages built to house his thousands and thousands of cars. A lot of the collection is kept secret. I mean, the only reason that we know about the Ferrari FX is because of a line in Ferrari's accounting records years later. But something happened in the late 90s that forced the royal family to open up their garage doors a bit. In 1997, Southeast Asia went through a financial crisis and oil prices plummeted. Now, as you can guess, this was bad news for the economy of Brunei, who made most of their capital from oil. That didn't stop Prince Akeem and Jeffrey from spending like it was the end of the world. Jeffrey allegedly kept 40 sex workers on call at all times and spent $7 million on a jewel encrusted watch. And that's totally worth every penny because the face of the watch had an animated picture of people doing sex. Sick. And by the time that 2002 rolled around, the Sultan was hurting and he needed to liquefy some of his assets. So he invited a Ferrari broker from California, that's where I live, by the name of Michael Sheehan, not that Michael Sheehan, to come check out some of the cars that the Sultan was looking to part with. The offer, 13 custom Ferraris and McLaren F1s for sale at a staggeringly low price. Like a pack of day old donuts. Mike hopped on a plane to Brunei and what he saw there would make Jay Leno roll over in his denims. At first, it wasn't bad, just excessive. Michael was led from garage to garage, each with its own theme. One building was filled with Porsches, from 911s to super rare 959s. Another building was filled with just black Mercedes S500 sedans. Now this went on for eight different two-story garages, each filled with about 240 cars. Now the heartbreaking part, is that some of the garages weren't temperature or humidity controlled, which means that they turned into greenhouses. Excess moisture and heat were literally cooking these super rare cars. Paint was peeling, leather and carpet covered in mold. Now I know this pales in comparison to the actual atrocities happening in the world, but man, these cars rotting is also a bummer. More than one thing can be a bummer. Like what's the point in having all these ultra rare cars if you never drive them and you just let them disintegrate in the corner of a garage in the jungle? And Michael's account was from 2002. That's like 20 years ago. It'd be very safe to say that a good amount of these cars are beyond repair. Some of them have zero miles on the odometer. They never got driven, they never, did what they were supposed to do. That means they're in hell. That means cars like the Mercedes CLK GTR, Lamborghini Uraco, Jaguar XJ220, Koenigsegg CCXR, and a BMW Nazca M12 prototype, one of only three ever made, are probably never gonna see the road. And that's sad to me. I know that this isn't a typical episode of this show where we celebrate the accomplishments of a racer or get pumped at how awesome a car is, but if nothing else, I think that we can all agree that this kind of greed sucks. What's the point of doubles and triples when no one can drive them? It's just like my hero, Benjamin Diesel said in the movie Fast and Furious with no thes. Nothing is sadder than locking a beast in a cage. 
Most badass thing anyone's ever said. That guy is tough and strong. I'm just working on my uh, old hog here, and you know what I realized? We just hit six million subscribers, dudes! One, two, three, four, five, six. Six! And just like with every major milestone that we have here at Donut, we're gonna release a limited edition six million sub sticker so that you can show everybody that you are part of the crew when we hit this number. Uh, this is like one of my favorite designs that we've done so far. I think it's super sick. It's only available for a very limited time. Go get yours today at DonutMedia.com. And again, thank you guys so much. This is way bigger than we ever thought it could be. We love you all. I love you. Thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you freaking liked it. If you did, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss more videos. Me and my friends put out a bunch of them almost every day. Uh, we got a bunch of merch, uh, donutmedia.com. We're dropping a new item every week. Uh, super proud of it. I really, really think we're, we're doing cool stuff. So head over there, get on the mailing list so you don't miss anything. Uh, follow me on social media, at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut, at Donut Media. Hit the like button, it really helps in the algorithm. I love you.